So, um, particularly, uh, a particular pleasure to have Robert here this morning because he's the author of a, a, a very recent book regarding blockchain, critical perspectives in law and technology. Um, I happen to know it's a really good book because I've read it. Uh, published by Routledge, and in it he looks at potential routes to regulation of blockchains, associated blockchain technologies, as well as uh, the conduct the technology fosters. He's a member of the all-party parliamentary group on blockchain at Westminster, and is currently writing a report for the EU Commission's Blockchain Observatory on legal recognition of smart contracts and blockchain registries. Uh, his further research interests include critical legal theory and philosophy, and more traditional jurisprudence, notably within property law, equity, and trusts. Uh, his work is recognised nationally and internationally. So. Uh, we have before us somebody who is um, a very serious ex expert in what he's going to talk to us about. So with no further ado, over to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I sincerely hope I can live up to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something actually fairly rare for me. I have to admit, I'm, I'm going to do this almost scripted. Um, which I don't normally do because I tend to like to wander around and wave my arms and, and sort of think on my feet a bit more. Um, but I think there's a lot to get through here, and I, and I respect the fact that this is a very detailed, very fast-moving uh, topic, um, and therefore, in order to sort of give it some serious structure for this morning and hopefully give you something to take away, I'm going to keep it, um, as I say, fairly, fairly scripted, um, now, I also respect the fact that the topics and, and some of my sort of terminology and use of terminology here will not necessarily go to a satisfactory depth for some people. Um, for others, it may still be, you know, too deep. Um, so, again, having spoken on this, on this topic and on blockchains now for, for several years, sort of gauging where the room is, if you like, in relation to, to their knowledge of the subject is, is never an easy thing. Um, and to begin, therefore, I, I absolutely understand there's probably a number in the room, and again, over the years that I've been doing this, the number of people in the room who know what blockchains are uh, has increased a lot, or, or their knowledge of them. Um, and yet there are still some people who, who don't know or are a little unsure about the details. Um, I, I would almost be sort of, kind of almost like to ask to do a straw poll to see whether people actually feel as though they need uh, a short video introduction <laughs> um, because I, it could save me time and I can get on with the detail um, or it may just sort of help bed things in uh, for what I'm about to say. So let's go for it. Uh, straw poll then. Uh, hands up. Who feels as though they would like to see a very brief video from the World Economic Forum? Okay, great. Fine. <laughs> that solves that then. That's an easy one. Um, now, of course, this being a talk on technology, the technology won't work. Um, but I will give it a go anyway. So this is just a couple of minutes long. Modern technology allows people to communicate directly. Voice and video calls, emails, pictures and instant messages travel directly from A to B, maintaining trust between individuals no matter how far apart they are. When it comes to money, people have to trust a third party to be able to complete a transaction. Blockchain technology is challenging the status quo in a radical way. By using math and cryptography, blockchain provides an open, decentralized database of any transaction involving value, money, goods, property, work, or even votes, creating a record whose authenticity can be verified by the entire community. The future global economy will move towards one of distributed property and trust, where anyone with access to the internet can get involved in blockchain-based transactions, and third-party trust organizations may no longer be necessary. The uses of blockchain technology are endless. Some expect that in less than 10 years, it will be used to collect taxes. It will make it easier for immigrants to send money back to countries where access to financial institutions is limited. Financial fraud will be significantly reduced, as every transaction will be recorded on a public and distributed ledger, which will be accessible by anyone who has an internet connection. Think of it as wills and contracts that execute themselves, or dated proof of existence for ideas, much like a patent. Blockchain will become a global, decentralized source of trust, but not everyone is ready to embrace it. 
A huge proportion of trust services, from banking to notaries, will face challenges on price, volume, and in some cases, their very survival. Public authorities could find it more and more difficult to enforce traditional financial regulations due to the new possibilities offered by the Bitcoin network to bypass traditional financial intermediaries. Unimagined new networks will evolve to meet society's needs more cheaply and potentially more securely. Will governments, financial and legal institutions embrace this blockchain? What will happen to the ones who don't? <coughs> Okay, um, I mean, for any of you who've spent any time uh, over the last few years looking into blockchain, you'll probably have a massive problem with some of the content of that video. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a couple of years out of date now um, in, in many respects, and the fundamentals are there, certainly, but at the same time, uh, there are a number of uh, elements within it uh, that are contestable, one might say, and certainly in relation to where uh, we are going with various aspects of blockchain, uh, and kind of cryptocurrencies in particular, I'm sure everyone who reads the news is, is well aware of the ups and downs of that. And um, there are a number of elements within the video itself. They refer only to the Bitcoin uh, blockchain in there. Obviously, we, we now know that they're, we're not talking about a blockchain. We're talking about multiple blockchains. Um, so there are various uh, elements here that we need to sort of take into consideration. For present purposes for today, one key element that was in, in that video where they talk about contracts that can execute themselves. Now this, again, is, is a very sort of basic idea, um, but it's the one upon which smart contracts, uh, or the, the issue of smart contracts, turns. Um, and certainly from my point of view, it's the point of view from which the challenge of smart contracts turns. So this is where I'm going to kind of switch to the script a bit more. Um, so. For present purposes, um, and for clarity today, I'm going to refer to traditional contracts uh, and smart contracts. Now, as I said earlier, I understand that that is, is sort of, uh, if you like, kind of denying a whole level of complexity, uh, which some people uh, might find <coughs> dissatisfying, uh, but uh, hopefully we can maybe pull out some of the detail in questions later. So I would distinguish between traditional contracts and smart contracts, where the latter is associated specifically with blockchain. Of course, a number of jurisdictions, such as the UK, EU, various member states, and the US already legally recognize digital signatures for binding agreements and contracts drafted using, for example, the DocuSign uh, platform. But with smart contracts, we are potentially talking about a different type of contract not least because signatures may be superseded by the use of public and private keys in order to validate a transaction. So getting away from the idea of signatures, whether digital or wet signatures. Um, although I hasten to add that no case law, so certainly from the legal point of view, uh, this hasn't really been confirmed yet in terms of, of public keys, although the Law Commission in a recent report on uh, the development of electronic signatures do talk about public keys um, as a validating process. So they're sort of working their way, if you like, into the fabric of how we validate and sign contracts. So traditional contracts can be described as agreements creating obligations enforceable by law, or as the law based on liability for <coughs> breach of promise. These definitions crystallize a traditional contract law view and importantly show that contracting does not simply involve creating obligations, but also provides a mechanism for situations in which promises fail to materialize or are not performed or expectations based on a promise are not met. But do definitions of tra uh, traditional contract law reasonably or suitably describe smart contracts as we find them today? Contrast traditional definitions with the one found in a new blockchain act which is presently working its way through the Illinois General Assembly uh, in the United States, in which a smart contract is defined as, quote, a contract stored as an electronic record which is verified by the use of a blockchain. A definition which at first blush appears to suggest that a smart contract is really nothing more or less than a traditional contract written to and executed on a blockchain. 
In other words, the blockchain transforms or translates the traditional into the smart through a process of hybridity. Now, Ethereum founder, Vitalik Buterin, again, for those of you who don't know, Ethereum um, offer uh, an alternative blockchain to the Bitcoin blockchain um, and have for a very long time promoted uh, the sort of the development of a number of uh, different applications such as smart contracts uh, and not necessarily just developing uh, the, the blockchain for cryptocurrency transactions. Uh, Ethereum founder Vitalik Buterin, speaking in 2016, claimed that a smart contract is a computer program that directly controls some digital asset. A definition that draws on the sort of seamless causality which is notable in algorithms. So if X, then Y. A causality, arguably, that is not or does not necessarily exist in the traditional contract law, nor, we might say, within the traditions of property law either. Uh, in which there is a much greater level of heterogeneity and contingency which form a key part and the real backbone of the contractual process. To his credit, Buterin seems uneasy, however, about the legality of smart contracts, or the legal complexion, perhaps. Uh, and in a recent Twitter exchange between Buterin and the publishers of the Crypto Law Review, uh, which is an organisation called Clean App IO, Buterin admitted to be clear, at this point, I quite regret adopting the term smart contracts. I should have called them something more boring and technical, perhaps something like persistent scripts. So there we see between kind of pushing back against the very idea of or just the nomination contract itself. Meanwhile, the wording applied by the Arizona state legislature is more rigorous. So smart contract uh, for them means an event-driven program with state that runs on a distributed, decentralized, shared and replicated ledger and that can take custody over and instruct transfer of assets on that ledger. The law firm Norton Rose Fulton Say their name. Uh, that was I now taken. What's up? Try it again. Was that meant to pop then? I thought it was meant to be a bit later. <laughs> the law firm Norton, Norton Rose Fulbright, who uh, have positioned themselves for quite a long time uh, as sort of the legal experts in developing smart contracts. Um, they add a further dimension to, to this definition of smart contracts by saying that they will often be used to document bilateral obligations between a user and a counterparty. Smart contracts inherently deal with issues of evidence and intention that are behind some formality requirements. But until legal systems add rules dealing with specifically, sorry, dealing specifically with smart contracts, these formalities will need to be satisfied. So there we very much hear the sort of the legal take on it, if you like. So that was a, a, a rather brief, but a hopefully um, sort of multi-dimensional look at some of the, the, the definitions of, uh, of um, smart contracts that are sort of floating around at the moment. So I want to get on to practical matters uh, to sort of look about you know, how, how these are sort of you know smart contracts are, are, are trying to exist in the world, if you like. And I'm going to kind of cover four areas. Now, some of these, are, are, again, are coming very much from the legal tradition. Uh, so I want to look at sort of the, this issue of, of how smart contracts are negotiating uh, the crossover between the real and the virtual world. Um, and here we encounter something called the oracle problem. Um, I also want to look at the, the question of contract formation, uh, which relates quite specifically to the use of language, something that the Norton Rose Fulbright definition uh, also referred to. Then I want to get on to remedies for breach of contract. Remedies, um, obviously, a, a backbone of traditional contract law and really where they stand in relation to um, sort of automatically executed contracts. And, and finally, to look at decentralized arbitration, which is this sort of solution, if you like, which is emerging to deal uh, with uh, perhaps a breakdown in traditional uh, remedial structures. For, for contracts. So let's begin by looking at what I'm referring to as the oracle problem, which is looking, well, I don't refer to it, sorry, the oracle problem, which is the negotiation uh, that smart contracts are making between the real and the virtual worlds. 
So initial conceptualizations maintain that smart and traditional contracts were not necessarily supposed to do or perform the same tasks uh, that, or achieve the same legal outcomes. Nick Zaspo, who is the lawyer and computer programmer, who is often cited as the conceptual inventor of smart contracts in the 1990s, concluded that, quote, smart contracts go beyond the vending machine in proposing to embed contracts in all sorts of property that is valuable and controlled by digital means. Very much the same point of view that Vitalik Buterin has. Smart contracts reference the program, that, pro that property sorry, in a dynamic, often proactively enforced form and provide much better observation and verification where proactive measures must fall short. The major caveat in Zaspo's account is the need for the property to be controlled by digital means. This raises the question of how effective smart contracts can be in a world where property is either not controlled by digital means uh, at all, or not by digital means that are compatible or interoperable. And this is effectively the oracle problem. We have a position where we are putting a lot of, um, uh, if you like, uh, or there's a lot of influence which is drawn around these oracles uh, which draw in sort of data and information from the outside world and allow them to sort of transpose um, uh, the, the electronic sort of execution into an electronic execution of smart contracts. Um, and obviously, at, at that point, we sort of start to confront a, a number of different issues, not least about who controls the oracles, um, what languages the oracles uh, are using, um, and how that can be transferred across um, maybe different forms of contract uh, or a sort of whether it, we need to kind of embed them somehow in some sort of universal rule set, uh, something that I will try to get to uh, later on if I have time. Um, so this is sort of one, you know, one of the fundamental problems. How do we, how do we deal with the real world, real world property with physical chattels, whatever it might be, a, a mouse? Yeah, or you know, a, a car or whatever it might be, which is physically real, um, but needs to somehow be controlled uh, and transacted and and subject to contract in a highly sort of digitised way. Uh, so this brings us on to an issue of uh, contract formation, um, and the problem here, a key problem that uh, can be identified is, is one of the language which is, is really going to be used in order to form that contract. So key to the legitimacy and scalability of smart contracts turns on the matter, matter of the contractual language, in particular the relative legibility and accessibility of natural language contracts. Now as I'm sure many of you are aware, English uh, really stands as, as the common standard for a number of international trade and consumer contracts, for example. Compared with computer language uh, or code of smart contracts, uh, which is obviously a universal language within computer programming, but not necessarily uh, in, in the wider sort of society. And under Section 7 of the Unfair Terms in Consumer Contracts Regulations 1999, obviously coming through, uh, drafted into UK law um, as, as an EU provision, <coughs> we find that written contracts uh, must be expressed in plain intelligible language, and therefore code, smart contract code, does not necessarily adhere to that very fundamental requirement. So we go back to maybe the Illinois General Assembly's definition of smart contracts. A contract stored as an electronic record which is verified by the use of a blockchain. In this particular example, it is entirely possible for a traditional or natural language contract to form the basis of the electronic record whether that's in the form, for example, of a scanned paper document, um, which would obviously contain any sort of wet signatures, or a PDF, uh, which can be signed electronically. Just two examples. In this case, the natural language of contract is not necessarily disturbed by the intervention of smart protocol, of protocols and reveal and um, retrieval and interpretation of the contract, whilst this may require additional IT support, or perhaps even eventually the intervention of artificial intelligence, uh, would still not be an unfamiliar task to members working in, in, in legal services, for example. If you compare this to Vitalik Buterin's definition, again, a smart contract is a computer program that directly controls some digital <coughs> asset. 
In this case, no documentary form of a contract exists outside of the electronic environment which has purposefully been established for its execution. The smart contract is either embedded in the property being conveyed or is formed at the moment of transaction. In this sense, smart contracts appear to replicate electronically a key formality of traditional contract formation, namely an enforceable pre-written promise. Now, I think this is interesting because it mirrors, albeit un unintentionally, I would suggest, principles relating to the validity of electronic signatures, which the Law Commission have recently uh, sought to clarify. Uh, usually, uh, intention, whenever, you know, it, sort of uh, the oral or sort of pre-written sort of elements of a contract uh, relate quite specifically to being able to uh, evidence uh, intention um, or the consent of parties to, to a contract. But in the context of smart contracts, the promise, so to speak, exists in the property itself, uh, subject to transaction. And the agreement held in the property could, therefore, potentially be interpreted and function like an implied contract term or reflect an intention to form a contract uh, which has not necessarily been made by the parties but which just exists in the property itself. So the pre-written stage in contract formation raises one final important question and that's the ability, final question, there are many questions, <laughs> final question here, the ability of smart contracts to mirror good faith principles and the reasonable expectations of parties. So smart contracts do, by their very nature, privilege the written or documentary form, they are coded, um, as evidence of contract form formation. Yet the matter of aura agreements, as promises made and as binding, based on evidence of the intention of the parties, is a long settled and general rule which is applicable to most types of property. So how can smart contracts ensure this rule remains in place and including associated considerations of good faith? If the answer is that oral agreements or good faith can be coded into smart contracts by, for example, a lawyer or a notary trained in smart contract formation and design, then once again, it must be asked whether this can be considered an improvement upon existing practices or a mere reinvention of them. Moreover, there is a specific tension that arises between good faith principles or requirements as a standard for fair dealing within contractual contexts. <coughs> and the promise of smart contracts and blockchains more generally to foster trustless or post-trust transactional regimes. If smart contracts negate good faith by design, this places a very heavy burden on smart contracts to maintain conditions in which good faith is no longer necessary. This presupposes that smart contracts can radically alter conduct in ways that continue to reflect good faith even in the absence of that principle. Um, and then, so this brings me on quite neatly uh, to the issue of remedies. Um, so it's a truism at the heart of contract law and through smart contracts appear to challenge is that property does not contract and people do. So to embed contracts in digitally controlled property as both Nick Zaspo and more recently Vitlak Buterin have suggested might presume that a breach of contract cannot occur. Equally, it obfuscates and renders uncertain the possibility for remedies in the event a breach does occur or a dispute arises. Smart contracts potentially change what Kevin Werbach and Nicholas Cornell in their very insightful article called Contracts Ex Machina, I would recommend reading it, uh, have called, quote, the posture of litigation. And rather than complaining parties seeking fulfilment of alleged promissory obligations, where that can Cornell explain, complaining parties will seek to undo or reverse completed transactions. Uh, this is something of a particular interest to me uh, as, as a sort of an equity scholar, uh, um, that I'm interested in, in really what, how, how this is fostering what might be called a rise of restitution uh, within contract law. Um, relative to, to where uh, restitution exists presently in, in traditional contracting. Something in, of interest to me, it might not be uh, of, of interest to the rest of you, but I would suggest it's going to be a fairly pertinent factor in the development of smart contracts. So, as an institution, contract law helps parties distribute or allocate risk by remaining very flexible and contingent. And much of this has to do with an ability of parties to change contracts 
well, that's some rectification, unwind agreements, which may have been made under duress, for example, or because of unconscionable bargains in the form of rescission. Uh, they can put parties back into a position that would have been that they would have been in but for the breach, um, which is obviously a form of restitution. <coughs> or they can enforce by an order of the court, uh, court performance of the contract. So as I mentioned a moment ago, restitution is a vital part of the suite of remedies uh, that contract law provides. And based on what Wayback and Cornell's claims are regarding the future of litigation under smart contracts, there is every chance we will see more, not less restitution demanded by parties to a dispute in a future of smart contracting. So many remedies are also obviously accompanied by damages. Damages will be the sort of default position for a breach relating uh, to, to the breach of uh, contract, um, and obviously there are obviously additional costs for litigation involved there as well. Um, but I would also like to highlight the equitable dimension of performance uh, that's going on here as well. Uh, that is an agreement uh, is performed as it was promised to be performed. And this is a long-standing principle of contract law, certainly in common law terms, uh, that reveals that agreements are not simply cold, hard transactions between parties contracting at arm's length, but morally binding promises. So to undermine or negate remedies poses therefore a significant risk to the integrity of smart contracts within the cognizance of traditional contract law, but also disturbs the moral basis of contract by effectively removing humanity, the human messiness, if you will, um, from the process of contracting um, and from the process of, of engaging in promissory obligations. So one answer to this uh, from you know, regular contracting parties might be, well, good. You know, there, there are all of these huge problems with contract law which have just seemed to rumble on, um, and they cause a lot of uh, inefficiency and, and uh, high levels of cost. Then perhaps smart contracts might be the ideal way just simply to cut through this. And you know, despite a number of civil procedure reforms over the last 30 years, talking about the UK really specifically here, including uh, reforms to court processes and the redistribution of workloads thanks to alternative dispute resolution. Uh, adjudication for contractual disputes, much like they are for any, anything else, can be complex, expensive, and inefficient, and do not come with a guarantee of justice. So one response to this, as mentioned earlier, is, is uh, specifically related to the smart contracting process, is what has been called decentralized arbitration. So decentralized arbitration is directly linked or indexed to smart contract transactions or assets. In the event of a dispute, and it's more likely to be a dispute than a breach, I would suggest, an arbitration process can be triggered. <coughs> Arguably, this approach to arbitration would be quicker and more cost effective because it would not require additional or external legal intervention or interference, depending on how you want to see it. And one business that is trying to implement this particular approach is uh, an organization called Open Court, um, who are a sort of a sub-organization, if you like, uh, of a company called Open Law, uh, who are based in the States. Um, and they are predominantly focused on, on smart contract development. So Open Court aims to provide, uh, quote, the first comprehensive step towards an end-to-end -end commercial transaction that incorporates smart contract powered arbitration system. Open law underscore their vision of a specific form of contract arbitration based on the following rationale. I quote, agreements incorporating smart contracts will not be immune to disputes and legal challenges. Parties will disagree about the terms governing their performance and disagree on how the smart contract was intended to operate. There also should be bugs, there also could be bugs in the smart contract itself creating complications or misaligned incentives. The risk of mistake becomes magnified as smart contracts increasingly interact with outside data provided by trusted oracles like Chainlink, but also require, hum uh, but also require humans to perform their terms. So I think within that, hopefully you'll see a number of the uh, topics that I've, I've covered already today. And this is important to note that whilst what Open Law describe is a, de is a decentralized form of arbitration, it sits alongside the decentralized nature of smart contracting, their vision does not appear to defeat nor explicitly want to defeat the notion of formal legal recognition. 
So I'm suggesting that they're not trying to necessarily escape, uh, if, you, if you will, the boundaries of, of legal systems or the cognizance of contract theory. Rather than disavow legal systems and by extension the legal recognition those systems facilitate, open law state that, and I quote, blockchains hold out hope to power global universally available judicial systems that deliver low cost and high quality dispute resolution services online. If implemented, the end result would be game changing. A globally accessible online court where people have an equal opportunity to receive low cost sophisticated and transparent judges, uh, justice regardless of their location or creed. Strange little target at the end. Uh, obviously, this is a private interest company. I, I would suggest we take that last quote with a bit of a pinch of salt because um, they are, at the end of the day, they are selling a product. Nonetheless, uh, it, is, um, it says something very interesting about where they see uh, decentralized arbitration sitting within um, contract theory more generally. And I just want to wrap up on uh, this particular section on, on practical matters. How am I doing for time, actually? Five minutes, okay, so I'm going to have to skip to the next bit, and, and so I'll, I'll do this and, and go to, go to my, con my conclusion. So what open law appears to be proposing, therefore, is a form of uh, private arbitration, effectively, which is conducted on the blockchain, and is an analogue of existing off-chain and even offline private arbitration frameworks. So notwithstanding the role that blockchain as a novel technology plays in facilitating the type, uh, the type of arbitration open law in vision, there is nothing fundamentally new about the proposal on offer, only a recalibration of existing methods and working practices. Moreover, there is certainly nothing new about the desire to deliver dispute resolution that is more efficient and cost effective than existing court systems are able to deliver or achieve. Perhaps more importantly, as ADR frameworks generally de demonstrate, this form of arbitration does not defeat legal recognition, but is a species of or alternative route to it. Um, so as time is fairly short, I mean, I will say something very, very quickly about what I was going to cover under my theoretical concerns. I think you may appreciate that within what I've said today are sort of interwoven a few theoretical points of view because a lot of this is still highly conceptual. Uh, we are dealing with some use cases, we are dealing with uh, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, but a lot of it is still very much um, a negotiation uh, of, of concepts and trying to see where they figure in, in existing frameworks, whether they be business or legal frameworks. Um, but what I want to quickly touch on, what I was going to cover under, under theoretical concerns, was really to return to this, this very, very briefly to this idea of, of, of the oracle. Because this mediation between the real and the virtual, or the real world and cyberspace, depending on what you want to say, um, I think it is going to be crucial for making smart contracts a sort of a scalable reality. Because if, if that's unachievable, then you're going to just end up with this perpetual hybridity. There's always going to be this sort of doing digital things to the real world, but the two never sort of meeting. Um, Wordback and Cornell refer to this in, in this sort of wonderfully terrifying way. They refer to smart contracts as, as like a Frankenstein's monster. Um, they also they, they talk about them as cyborgs as well, this sort of strange meeting of science and nature, um, which is sort of a, a very interesting, very theatrical way of, of approaching this problem of, of sort of the real world and, and the, the virtual world. Um, and one of the things that I'm working on in particular uh, in my work at the moment in this report that I'm writing for the EU Commission Blockchain Observatory is very much centred on this idea of how, how you develop legal recognition of these uh, particular um, applications, registries and, and smart contracts in particular. Um, and one of the areas I'm exploring is the notion of a legal interface, which turns upon, and I'm not trying to develop some sort of business plan here, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of working through the kind of conceptual um, elements of this. The, um, the legal interface really turns upon the notions of, of the oracles, which I referred to earlier, and which obviously open law uh, refer to themselves and, and speak directly of Chainlink uh, as, as a very particular oracle. But the idea of oracles um, being sort of government-owned uh, possibilities as well, um, at the APPG blockchain down in Westminster a couple of weeks ago, um, this discussion was raised about the possibility of government, uh, a highly sort of government-regulated oracle, 
which would be used to, to help define um, a sort of a universal set of rules and terms for smart contracting. Um, and I find this, this stuff very interesting and have, and have sort of figured it into my thinking around the legal interface and also drawing on ideas um, which are, are very much being explored more generally um, to do with internet constitutionalism and the idea that it's possible to, de uh, to develop and build uh, effectively an internet bill of rights. Now we all know the internet has now been around for, for, for you know, several decades and, and no one has managed to achieve this yet. It was almost, there was something near a, an internet constitutionalism at the very onset of, of sort of mass adoption of the internet than there is now. Um, it's obviously it's fragmented uh, quite a lot. Um, and there is a lot of effort that's going in to try and pull it back together to a uniform set of rules, a bill of rights, a constitution, however you might want to see it. Um, and I think this is prob you know, possibly an interesting angle to, uh, from which to explore uh, a sort of, if you like, an overall regulatory framework for small, smart contracting. So it's a, a form of constitutionalism. Um, haven't really got any more time to say anything about that. Happy to explore it more in questions if you like. Um, so just going to sort of wrap up with, with uh, some, some thoughts on, on perhaps where this is going next couple of minutes of it. So blockchain technology is a highly reliable witness to ideas and events in the sense that it bears no relation to the fallibility of human memory whilst maintaining an inescapable dialogue with it. Blockchain <coughs> records and it represents data, it appends and witnesses, it materializes and dematerializes and it reconfigures information and does so in ways that both reflect existing internet capabilities and intensifies them for the purposes that are primarily economic but nevertheless result in social, cultural and political consequences. Blockchains offer transnational and transjurisdictional ways of working, including the possibility of machine-to-machine -machine invisible functionality, fully autonomous systems in the form of DAOs as they're called, <coughs> underpinned by self-executing code, perpetual scripts, to return to Buterin's uh, sort of redefinition of smart contracts, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, IoT, um, and of course the big one, artificial intelligence, um, or a combination of all of these. Um, and indeed, artificial intelligence is likely, I would suggest, to be the next major step with respect to contracts. Uh, again, at the APPG of Westminster, um, there was a particular representative there uh, who was talking, about, uh, who wanted to talk about AI instead of blockchain when it came to, to contracting, and he wanted to talk not about smart contracting, he wanted to talk about intelligent contracts. Uh, he was almost uh, uh, quite annoyed that people were stuck on this idea of just being smart. He wanted things to be intelligent, not smart, which I thought, again, <laughs> was sort of an interesting uh, uh, way to sort of speak to a room uh, of people who, who obviously were, were kind of fascinated by the idea of smart contracts, and he was effectively saying, you're already, we've already left you behind. <laughs> so problems persist, however. In jurisdictions such as the UK and the EU, uh, uh, individual member states within the union as well, there is a lingering uncertainty over blockchains. We know this because there is no case law, there is no firm legislation, there are no real firm uh, regulations. Um, and there really is, from my point of view, a, a gross lack of focus on blockchain conduct, uh, the conduct which is produced by uh, blockchain use cases. So blockchain conduct requires that lawmakers focus not on the technology or the applications exclusively, but on those who engage with them. So developers, designers, users, consumers, prosumers, data providers, whoever it might be. Uh, and also on the behaviors specifically and the practices that the technology facilitates. So generally speaking, it is correct to assume that technology does not break laws, it does not breach contracts, and it does not contravene rights. People do. This means lawmakers must remain in step with conduct produced by the technologies such as blockchains and not allow legal recognition to lag too far behind. And I would finally say that that really does apply in the situation that we are seeing with the development of smart contracts. And I will stop. Okay. I fear I probably ran over. It was, I'll blame the video. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Robert, and um, I'm sure that we're going to have plenty of questions. Um, uh, Lucy is uh, wandering the floor with a microphone. Uh, who would like to ask the first question? If people need a moment. 
I, should, I, I have one for you. Um, you, um, you talked a little bit about uh, existing technology and forms of digital signatures. Mm -hmm. There's another um, uh, existing technology where some of the things that you've been talking about seem to apply, which is digital rights management mm -hmm. intellectual property. Yeah. Are, there, are there lessons from digital rights management for, for, for this field? Uh, I'm, I'm to, I, have, I haven't looked at that specifically. I mean, I haven't even, so obviously, um, I'm making certain connections here, um, which to some extent are being made, to, just to return specifically to, to electronic signatures. I was reading through the very recent report, the decision on, on clarifying the legality of, of, of electronic, electronic signatures in the UK really, <coughs> excuse me, really has only been made by the Law Commission this summer. We've had that, that sort of the laws are in place based on EU regulations for several years, but the clarity around UK law was never there. So I was, I, this has only come to light through the Law Commission recently, and reading through their report on, on electronic signatures is where I found uncovered in there, um, and I believe it's only mentioned once that there is talking about, and also the possibility of public key verification um, for contracting, which is clearly a sort of a cheeky little reference to the uh, possible onset of smart contracting. So that's where I've sort of, I've made a kind of, I reverse engineered that connection, if you like. I haven't done the same thing uh, with digital rights management, um, but I would suggest that if, if the, the mechanisms uh, uh, are the same, I mean, it depends whether you're talking legally or technolog technologically, I suppose, as well. If the technological mechanisms are the same, there is every chance that the legal ramifications surrounding them um, will mirror one another. Hi there. Um, don't have questions relevant here, but many years ago, um, a computer or a set of algorithms uh, defeated um, chess grandmaster. Mm -hmm. The yeah. poor set of algorithms that are driving our cars for us, and it doesn't need a human. Now, you're saying that smart contracts are foolproof at this stage, they can work on its own, uh, but it might not be in the future someone could develop mm -hmm. some. Set algorithms to, to defeat them or whatever. My point is, if I've got my money in the bank, I know 85,000 pounds of that is protected. Mm -hmm. I don't have that money right now, but you know, I know, I know okay. that uh, it is safe, but how do I know that my money in this codes or whatever, if I were to use blockchains to, to transactions, you know, I have no protection. So you know, just your, your thoughts on that. Oh, uh, you, you, I mean, it's math. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, there is so much I was not, not going to be able to cover in this. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the um, I mean, perhaps on that first point, just to, to kind of talk a bit more grandly, the idea that, um, so let's talk about blockchains here specifically rather than smart contracts. So smart contracts is an application um, or, or a piece of code which is sitting on the blockchain. Blockchain is itself as, as a sort of a, um, an immutable and highly secure um, um, sort of um, digital architecture, if you like, um, is unfortunately already not, you know, is soon not to probably to be the case. Um, and, and the cryptography, which everyone is so enthusiastic about, is itself going to be massively undermined by the onset, the rapid onset of quantum computing, for example. Uh, I'm no specialist in this. I've, ha I've had to learn some of these things. So. Anyone who's in the room who knows about quantum computing in detail, please don't ask me <laughs> sort of uh, high-end mathematical questions because I'm not going to be able to answer them. But what I do know is from uh, from what I've read and from experts that I've spoken to is that the, the, the sheer power, the processing power of, of, of quantum computing is completely going to destroy um, what blockchains can achieve. So that's sort of a reflection on, on what you were saying a moment ago. The, the other matter on, on sort of the security of funds based around smart contracts, um, again, I suppose it really depends on whether you're using smart contracts or, or the, the if, if, if it comes back to protecting money, to protecting a, a fund of wealth or something, and obviously there are existing um, uh, sort of regulatory reasons <coughs> for that around fiat currencies, if you're trading in, in, in pounds or, or dollars or euros or whatever it might be. Um, that would certainly uh, underpin um, any, any sort of transactional form. I think we can all agree sort of electronic transactions are nothing new in that sense, and this would not necessarily change it. The matter is obviously different when you start getting into cryptocurrencies, and we know that it, it is a bit more uh, wild west, is the, the term which is commonly used. Um, 
but so I, I would suggest that um, uh, I mean for us, the th I mean the thing about and, and so much to say about this the, the point about the restitution of smart contracts the, the point that you would want to sort of get something back after it's done says something very important about smart contracts as a sort of an executable form they just go ahead and do it the, f the contract doesn't really care what the what the context what the situation is if you if you if the contract has been instructed to pay someone something it will send the money and then you have to try and claw that back so from the point of view, if, if the agreement is somehow incorrect or misguided, um, the, so from that point of view, yes, you, you could end up, there could be a whole raft of litigation around how this fits into existing regulatory regimes for the protection of, of financial transfers. Um, because yes, it, they might be secure, um, but they, they also could end up just, as I say, executing sort of uh, transactions of, of, of money um, really when people hadn't necessarily intended it quite in that way. I, there's, there's so much to say about that. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of almost too much detail to give you a plain answer. So, let's take a look. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. No. This. This is. This is. This is a massive problem. Um, I mean, the because I, I, as I've I've returned to time and again, the, in order to to get away from this this um, unsatisfactory hybridity of still using sort of effectively offline or off chain contracts, but then simply executed or so, so you know whether they're scanned documents, you are going to sort of need this connection to be made. You are going to need oracles, which are going to be able to sort of draw in information um, to, to give some sort of context around the smart contract, which is is built. And so, yet yeah, the oracle does, in that sense, uh, become a um, a weak point, if you like, because and this is why the, the conversation, as I, as I mentioned, that we were having um, down in Westminster a couple of weeks ago, uh, was so interesting um, from the point of view of of the role that governments um, and state regulators may have in this, because. Decisions may need to be made about whether we want the oracles to be state-run entities or whether we want them to be private entities. Because if if, if oracles are simply going to be um, private interest businesses, then that's going to come with a lot of the baggage that private interest means. If we want them to be government state-run entities, then that's going to come with a lot of the baggage that we get with state and government-run uh, entities as well. So. The fact of the matter is that they can't, there is no de facto trust in them. There's no de facto trust in blockchains. Everyone likes this idea of, of verification um, and this post-trust environment which is created by blockchains. But the truth of the matter is uh, that you put rubbish into something, you're going to get rubbish out. It's, it's a classic um, sort of problem uh, with digital information, I would suggest. So they, they can't, they can be trusted in of themselves, but that does not mean they facilitate a general form of trust, if you will. Because, I mean, it's, I, 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 I'm sort of worried about kind of drawing an analogy with fake news here, but there is this, this idea that you, you tell someone something and it's not, and, it, and it, it, if there's no fundamental truth to it, but it gets retold and it almost becomes a truth. And this is that, that rubbish in, rubbish out thing. It just perpetuates, but it's not necessarily. So it, it's a form of trust, but it's not a universal understanding. I accept the you know, uh, uh, guardian garbage out. Mm. Yes, that is a very common theme in yeah. IT. What I, if I understand correctly now, is that oracles are no different from being a detective engines that mm. knowledge depositories. Mm. Either driven heuristically yeah. or driven by all certain predefined algorithms, mm -hmm. and or maybe hybrid of the two. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm 
I'm not on the sort of the technological side here, so I can't answer that necessarily at the technological level, but I know that it is it incorporates those things, it incorporates uh, real world sensors and things like this as well. So one of the classic ones which is often used um, is to, if, if you're doing a contract of, um, where an airline has to repay customers for a flight which could not take off because of adverse weather conditions, the Oracle that is feeding the information into that particular agreement will be based on weather data, which is coming from a specific weather station. Now, that data itself um, is obviously is going to be the best and the, the most trusted source that we can have. But it's, I, I, you know, and yes, it's probably going to be fairly accurate. <laughs> but I mean, again, I'm no meteorologist. I don't necessarily know what the, what the um, there's going to be some sort of level of which that could not be the case. And if we're talking about very fine lines within a smart contract here, which will execute on without that, enough of that flexibility, enough of that contingency, um, then you could have payments being made based on data which is, is you know, very slimly defined, um, or adversely payments not being made on the same ground. Yes. Yes. Hey, it is, it is. It is. But flex so flexibility and contingency is, is really the key here. And there is a lot of work going into that at the moment. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm with my practical frame of mind here. You sort of linked objects to computer programs in this sort of scenario. Well, what about um, things like services provision? Uh, for example, cleaning for the whole of the European University, you know, where human behavior becomes a major element. Um, how, how do you see that being uh, taken advantage of the smart contract? Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, do you know what? I, again, I've, I've looked into this, and um, because you, with, with effectively with smart contracting, and most of the, the um, conversation is, is out there is about financial transactions. It's not about service contracts. It's not about employing contracts. It's not about. It's it's really it's, they're interested in contracts which don't necessarily have to involve human beings um, or human behaviour is perhaps a, a specific way of putting it. Um, so I can't really find any. I can't really find a, a lot of detail. Um, I haven't found a lot of detail at this moment in time. Um, about uh, for, for smart contracts which will deal specifically with, with service sector stuff or with, with um, human behaviours, whether that's a form of employability or whatever it might be. Um, I'm sure it's impossible to draw them up, but obviously going back to the point we were just making there, what it's going to do is it's going to um, predefine, and now a number of us might think that our employment contracts are constraining. We might think that, but the reality of it is if, if you're told as per your contract, you have to be in three days a week to a particular place, and you have a few weeks where you don't come in, probably not going to matter. But in a, in a digital contract which doesn't allow that, then it's going to start sort of claiming breach of contract when you don't show up. How it knows you don't show up then unlocks a whole other raft of, of very interesting um, uh, possibilities, because again, we come back to forms of monitoring and censoring, again, the sort of the Oracle issue. Um, now, I don't know if anyone heard on the radio this morning, on the Today programme, there was an interesting report about uh, an NHS trial where they're uh, implanting sensors in, in people's houses, uh, people suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's, um, which is allowing people to stay at home um, because effectively their houses have become mass sensor stations. They're, just, they're, they're collecting data on that person's movements, blood pressure, everything on, on a sort of minute by minute basis and plowing that data into a, into a central control station. Is it really too far, I'm not going to get too conspiratorial about this, but is it too far to suggest that that's what workplaces become in order to fac facilitate employment contracts or whatever it might be? Um, that, again, is, is somewhat terrifying, but it's entirely possible. understand the concepts of having uh, registers of, say, property and, and money, so that you can use a blockchain to execute a transfer of one um, block, you know, money to one person and property to the other person. Um, and even for the sale of goods, you might be able to have some terms that will always apply because they're sort of in the general or bog standard implied terms. But 
in more complex scenarios where there are terms that parties are going to want to negotiate, so you're going to have one party that wants terms that protect from particular risks and the other party who's not willing to go that far. How that? How is that negotiation of the terms? Is it just going to be completely ignored? Is it going to be that there's one standard? Is it going to be that you might have particular options and depending on the option that you choose and the risk that's allocated, that affects the price and you go, how, how is that going to be managed in a smart contract scenario? Well, I, I, I think it's entirely possible, and there are a number of organisations which are uh, building kind of boilerplate and sort of drop down menu style contracts. So you, you piece them together like a jigsaw until you get the, the contract that you're happy with. But at the end of the day, they, they still don't necessarily, and they're not providing uh, a, a desirable level of flexibility um, which matches existing contract law. Um, now, again, there are, you know, there are two sides to this. But the, the people who want that inflexibility, who want the contract just to do or want people or transactions to happen um, just like that, this sort of contract is, is going to seem fantastic because it, it just means that it will happen. Um, but it's, it, it's a debate that we need to have. We, it, this is why, it, this is a sociological problem. It's a political issue. Um, you know, it's economic, it's legal, it's political, it's sociological. Um, because it, it's gonna, society is going to have to ask itself, because we all know how important contract is. We can go back to Hobbesian notions of social contract if you really want to, because, it, but we know that contract is a fundamental uh, way that we negotiate one another uh, in society. And whilst that might seem like a great leap to these sorts of questions, I don't believe it is, because as a society, we need to start asking ourselves, do we want to become, um, go back to how it was referred to in the, I can't find it now, how it was referred to in the, um, the, the video I showed at the beginning, um, just automatically executable sort of, uh, uh, ex automatic sort of society, if you like, or do we want to still have that kind of, that, messes, that messiness and that contingency? Um, it's, so, you know, uh, it's possibly, it's entirely possible to do those sorts of things, but it's, it's whether we want as a society to have those sorts of terms imposed upon us. Do we have a choice? <laughs> of course, as well, within democratic societies, perhaps we do. I don't know. I mean, uh, the, again, these are massive questions uh, because it, it comes down to sort of the, the, the balance of, of, I guess, of, uh, of democratic principles and private interests and, and things like this. Uh, <laughs> um, do we, do we want to go there now? <laughs> I don't know. I think the only question we thought in that would be is it ethical to use yeah. systems? Um, um, again, um, I, you know, I, I made a, a point of saying that for me, the, this, sort of, this automatic, this executable element of, of smart contracts, um, which seems to undermine uh, the remedial nature of contract law, um, and especially within the common, you know, the common law remedies of performance, um, which uh, you know I, I'm familiar with as, as a common lawyer. The um, we know that they come with a very long history, a very long tale of ethical and, and moral considerations. And so the suggestion could be that, that that tale just gets cut off because it's seen as inefficient, it's seen as not cost effective. But, okay, that's one answer, but do we want that? I mean, so yes, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right, is it ethical? Um, I mean, yeah. I, I, I cover some of this stuff in my book. I did. <laughs> so, uh, um, hope, hopefully, you might find some answers in there, although uh, it, it's more questions than answers. In in today's world, we've got uh, something called collaborative working which runs right across, very often trying to join up supply chains. Um, and that implies a lot of flexible contracting. Is smart contracting going to be able to cope with this? What is the impact going to be on it? Um, well, possibly not. I think on, based on, on a, a number of the, the, the questions we've already covered in relation to the, the flexibility issue, um, I would suggest probably not. It, what it might do is it, it, it might um, maybe even calcify the idea of, of collaboration. It will make it a very rigid enterprise. What I will, uh, maybe a better answer in this, but not necessarily um, 
a favourable one, perhaps when it comes to the idea of collaboration as, as an exercise which um, gives people jobs in many, in, in, in sort of many respects, is actually that there will be a form of an intelligent collaboration which will involve AI, um, I would suggest. I mean, I think, I, I really can't under, underestimate, uh, or we shouldn't really underestimate the impact that artificial intelligence is going to have on any of this. Because as soon as, um, I mean, we obviously we already have a form of algorithmic learning and machine learning, which is feeding into smart contract design, but it's nothing compared to, to what AI is going to be able to achieve, or indeed what quantum computing is going to be able to achieve as well, because quantum computing is going to come uh, itself, um, and there's going to probably be a lot of replication of, of these architectures, so there will be a form of quantum smart contracting and things like this. The, but the point of AI is that the, 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 the ability to, to gather information um, and flexible contingent information at speed and process that in, into sort of constantly evolving and developing contracts is, is just going to be, is going to, it'll be phenomenal. Um, and, it, and it really will, I, I suggest, transform um, this particular topic far more, far more than smart contracting. Whatever the smart contracting is, if you will, this kind of this, this first sort of exploratory step away from um, the, the, the kind of the safe comfort of traditional contract law. AI, I think, is just going to be a, is going to be a, a sort of a, a shot to the stars, perhaps. But again, the, I'm starting to sound a bit evangelical about this. I don't know. It's going to come with obviously a whole raft of ethical concerns. Uh, it will amplify the sort of ethical concerns I think we've already spoken about. That. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've, uh, we've come to our allotted time for the talk where you, so time to say thank you to Robert. <laughs> We're, we have this room until 10 o'clock. You're very welcome to stay for further conversation. Uh, I'm sure Robert will be very happy to uh, take further questions informally. Um, but uh, otherwise, thank you very much and thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone.